how much more will the blood of Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Well, saints, today we're going to look at how to be saints. I'm not sure if you noticed, but we, we had, we've been working through the book of Hebrews, and now we come to this point where it talks about priests offering sacrifices and doing all these things. And when you think about the great saints of old, they all had these tremendous sacrifices they did. They would give things up or they would do things, and, and that's why we remember these saints of old, right? So did you see that in our reading in, in Deuteronomy, it talked about what you need to do or not do, love God, love people? You then see um, in the psalm that we read today, all about following God's commandments and keeping His statutes. And then we see about temple sacrifices and the right things to do in Hebrews, and then Jesus tying it all together with what's the greatest commandment. What you think? Commandment. Just one commandment, right? But Jesus says you can't say that you love God without loving people. Or you can't say, well, I love people but not love God. They both go hand in hand. It's hand in glove. If you do one, you got to do the other. Or if you do the other, you got to do the one. It doesn't matter. So I was recently at a um, meal with someone at a, at a party, and they were talking about what industry they were in. They were in the space exploration business, and they said, you know, man, uh, I just, I, I love Blue Origin. I love everything that Jeff Bezos does, and and I just hope that with all the good that he's done with Amazon and Blue Origin, that, that hopefully God will let him into heaven. And I thought to myself, well, if that's the case, if God's only going to let trillionaires into heaven, we're into a whole world of hurt. If doing the right thing for God means like getting everyone in southern, you know, sub-Saharan Africa vaccinated, then you and I don't have a chance, right? So what does it mean to be a saint? And I think the thing to, to think about this is the Bible has two amazing ways in which God communicates to us. The two ways in which he communicates, both in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And sometimes people think Old Covenant is one way of communicating and New Covenant or New Testament is one way, right? And sometimes they think of it, the idea of like Old Testament law, New Testament gospel, right? Those are theological terms, but that can throw us off. So let me just use two more modern terms or more common terms. Think of it as this way as command and promise, right? So you heard Deuteronomy talking all about commands. The psalm talking all about command, but guess what? And sometimes you say, oh, there's a lot of commands in the Old Testament, and then there's a lot of promise in the New Testament. But, but you know, it's just the, the God of the Old Testament, he was kind of mad and angry, bloods of, you know, the blood of goats, bulls, and whatnot. And, you know, that's very, you know, the God of the Old Testament just didn't take his Prozac, right? <laughs> he was, there was a lot of command stuff. And then the, the God of the New Testament, well, that's Jesus, and it's just much nicer. Well, sorry, hate to break it to you, but there's a lot of promise in the Old Testament, and there's actually a lot of command in the New Testament, right? Jesus is the one that says, you have heard it say, thou shalt not murder, but I tell you, don't even call someone a fool. That's just as murderous in your heart. Wait, I think that's even more intense than the old, than the old covenant, if you want to think of it. Like, Jesus intensifies. But the point is, I want to think of command and promise as the ways of phrasing how to understand how we can become saints. And what this does for us, command and promise, shows us two things. The command shows us the depth of our problem, and the promise shows us the extent to which Jesus rescues us. The depth of our problem. Now, the interesting thing about the law or commands, there's plenty of do's and do nots. Um, there's Ten Commandments, right? But then if you go through the whole Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, you find 613 other do's and don'ts. And then you can come up with like 18,000, sorry, 1,849 emendations to that. But let's not focus on that. I'm just saying that there's a lot of do's and don'ts, right? That's a, that's a lot of command. And that can really weigh you down. So on Halloween of 1517, a young Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther um, was really weighed down by this whole thing. He read one of those commandments in the book of Habakkuk, and it said, the righteous shall live by faith. That shall is a command. And he's like, how can I do this? 
the righteous will live by faith. I don't, I'm a monk. I'm not even a lay person anymore, and I still don't feel like I'm measuring up. You see, one of the things that the command, the commands of God do, the law, it acts as a mirror. And a mirror is a wonderful thing. It's a particular tool used for a particular thing. And you should use it that way, but don't use it a different way. Um, so, say for example, this morning I woke up and I discovered that I needed to shave. So I looked in a mirror. And the command of God is like a mirror. It should be used that way. But if I use the command of God to do what it's not intended to do, like, okay, it shows me I've got some scruff. Now I need to shave. You would think I'm very strange and weird if I started rubbing my face against the mirror. <laughs> the mirror is incapable of doing that. The command can't make you a saint. It can only show you how you're missing the mark. But the promise... That's what shows you how it's done. The promise. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It's about a change of heart, the change of our motivations. And did you catch that? How much more will the blood of Jesus Christ purify our consciences? The book of Hebrews is the, the book of the Bible which uses the word conscience more than any other book in all of the other 66 books. Conscience. And there's this whole thing, like, our conscience works along with God's commands to say, oh, here, I'm measuring up or not measuring up. And just imagine this. Imagine if God said, look, yeah, my command acts like a mirror, but you know what? Okay, you don't believe in me. That's fine. I'm, I'm a nice guy. At the end of time, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm just going to hang a, an invisible MP3 around your neck, and as you walk around, um, every time you say you should do this or you shouldn't do this, the MP3 reader will turn on and record your thou shalts and your thou shalt nots. And then you get to heaven and God's like, look, I'm a nice guy. I'm not going to do my Ten Commandments. I'm going to do, hmm, I'm just going to do Audra's Ten Commandments and just see all those times that your thou shalts and thou shalts not clicked on. And then God's like, hey, did you live up to that? And I think you and I know where we'd end up, right? Not on his Ten Commandments, but our own Ten Commandments. And so the, 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 the command is this mirror that allows us to, to see what we need to fix, but it, it's not intended to fix the problem. It's intended to show the problem. But the other thing the command is intended to do, it's, it's intended to show you what it should look like. What does it look like to be a saint? Now, it, Paul says in one part, like, and we're celebrating All Saints, right? All Saints Day, where we remember those who have gone on to glory. And we, we, we sang the hymn as we processed in, the strife is o'er, the battle is won. And when you think about it, when you look at the old prayer book, the 1928 prayer book or the 1662 prayer book, at the, your baptism it said we would, we would baptize someone, we would sign them with the sign of the cross, we'd say, fight valiantly as a soldier of Christ against the flesh, the world, and the devil, and remain faithful to, the, to Christ and to the end of your life. So we're part of this church that is fighting against those baser urges to do the wrong things, and we want to live up to those commands. But we recognize our inability to do that. But in comes the rescuer, the promise. And do you know where the promise first shows up? Is it Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? No. It shows up as early as Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And that's what we call the first promise, or the protevangelium, the erst gospel, if you were reading in the old in the, in the old Anglo-Saxon, the first promise. When everything's thrown awry because our first parents are unable to keep the command. God doesn't say, you messed it up, I'm done with you. God enters in with the first promise. I will put enmity between you and the snake. He, the snake, will bruise your seed's heel. Like, so he's talking to Eve and he's saying, Eve, you're going to bear someone and your great, 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 great granddaughter is going to bear someone and this person is going to crush the works of darkness and of evil and sin and usher in goodness. That's the first promise. You see, every other world system out there, and, and whether it's theological or philosophical or even non-philosophical, just whatever you want to look at it, they, they tend to tell you, do. That's command, right? But do you know what promise is? Promise is done. Think about that. Because one says, here's everything you either have to think, do, or feel. But in, in Jesus Christ, in the gospel, the promise tells you this, that Jesus has already 
done everything. And that changes the way that we look at ourselves, the way that we look at the world, the way that we even interact. Did you see in Jesus' passage with the Pharisees, they come up to him, and the Pharisees were super moral and super righteous. They weren't, they weren't bad people. In fact, they were super good people. But did you see what the writer of Hebrews says? He says, the blood of Jesus will purify our consciences from dead works. And what does that mean? Well, the, 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 the idea of dead works is that, you see, very moral, and this does, you don't have to be religious, but very moral people, are, they, they behave well, right? They tend to repent for their bad stuff. They say sorry for the bad stuff. But the difference between a, a moral person, so the law conforms you, the gospel transforms you. A moral person repents for their wrongdoing. Someone who's been transformed by Jesus Christ and the gospel repents even for the motives of their good doing. Think about that. Why did the Pharisees ask Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Because for them, following the commands wasn't about pleasing God. It was all about how can I get God to do what I need him to do for me? What is that I can get you? How can I blackmail you into doing that? And you don't even have to be a Pharisee. It's just saying that we all, inside all of our hearts, you know, they, some people say, inside you are two wolves. No, inside of you are two. There's the Pharisee and then there's the disciple. Which do you want to be? You have to choose. And the whole point is that the blood of Jesus changes us so that we don't just repent of what we've done wrong. We even repent of our wrong motives even when we do the right thing. And think of the freedom of, of that because the, 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 there is something that's really enslaving about having to do and perform and whatnot. I mean, I don't know if you grew up caring a lot about what your report card said or what your friends said about you, but that can be debilitating. You're always being measured. You're always realizing that you fall short. But if you realize that you go from the verb do to the verb done. You see, do is what we call in the imperative. Done is what we call it's in the indicative. Someone already did that. And what that means for us is this. Jesus has done everything. Think about the night before Jesus goes to the cross. It says that there in the Gospel of John, having loved them, he loved them to the end or to the full extent. And what does that mean? When, when, it, when you understand that done, that Jesus finished everything, when he says on the cross, it is finished, that's what it means to be loved to the full extent. And, and this is what that meal that night looks like. There's 13 people sitting around a table, Jesus and his 12 friends. Jesus knows that one of them is going to betray him. Another one is going to deny him. And the other 10 are going to run away. And he still chooses to love them. Think about that. Like, if it's about performance, those 12 have failed. But I'm so thankful for grace. That's what the grace is. That's what promise is. Grace is promise. Command is law. But the beauty of what grace does is it transforms the way that we look at doing the law. Are you familiar with A Christmas Carol? I know it's not Christmas yet, but my daughter said it's November 1st, so she started playing Christmas music in my car. Not my wife's car, but my car. But in A Christmas Carol, right, you see this guy who doesn't measure up to the standards of the day. You see Scrooge, right? He's a man who's made all this money, and he's totally messed things up, and he's just stingy. And so he gets the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas future that shows up to his life. And at the end of it, he discovers that he hasn't measured up to who he was supposed to be. Like, God wants all of us to be saints. And we all know that we're not measuring up. But after the ghost of Christmas future shows up, what becomes the motivating factor in Scrooge's life? Is it guilt? Is it fear? And the truth of the matter is, like, you know, even at the beginning of A Christmas Carol by Dickens, that 
they, they, some folks show up to get money for the poor house, and he refuses to be generous. It's easy to try to get people to be generous by guilting them, like, you should give or we can't keep doing ministry to the poor, as, you know, in, as it happens there in, in Dickens' book. But what happens is that what transforms Scrooge into a generous person? Is it guilt? Is it fear? Is it the command, be generous? No. It's that when he realizes the depth of his depravity and then the extent of God's forgiveness. Like, the ghost of Christmas future comes and says, this could be your future, but because of Jesus Christ and the cross, that is not your future. Your future is one of joy and one of promise and one of resurrection. You don't have to experience the grave. That's why on All Saints Day, when we remember people's names, we are joyfully celebrating the resurrection. And so the the truth of the resurrection breaks into Scrooge's life. And he wakes up, and what he thought was a nightmare turns into nothing but a dream. And what does he do? He starts conniving. I mean, he's like plotting. How can I be generous? Like, how can I go and get Tiny Tim a turkey? And how can I go bless you know, my secretary at my office, and how can I go about my life being as generous as I can? You see, grace transforms you from from just thinking, oh, I have to do this too. I want to do this. That's what turns you from a slave into a son. In the words of the hymn writer Isaac Cooper, to see the law of love by Christ fulfilled turns duty into joy. You go from being a slave into a son and a daughter. That's what allows you to become a saint when you understand grace rather than law. So Lord, we thank you for your goodness towards us today. And as we celebrate all saints, may we see the depth of where we've been rescued from, but may we rejoice in the extent of everything that you have done to rescue us and to give us new life. And we ask that we may live into that sainthood that you have called us into. And we ask this all in Jesus' strong name. Amen.